Good morning and welcome to our worship today with the Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you've chosen to be with us in worship. It's good to be back with you after a week's, week away in vacation. I want to give thanks to Peter Laufer for his prelude this morning and the postlude that will come, both of which are dedicated to Earth Day. Uh, his jazz renditions of hymns that speak to the creation, God's creation, and our place in it. Thank you, Peter, for that. We are a congregation that continues to be alive this past week. Um, I understand about 20 folk were delivered soups that the people of the church had made, gathering cookies and cornbread to go with the soup and delivered over different, different times during the week. We continue to gather for different Bible studies and studies. Remind you that every Sunday morning at nine o'clock, uh, Sam Bonner leads his Bible study, and you'll find the link for that in the newsletter and on, on our website. This afternoon at one o'clock, we will continue with our adult education hour with the study of Always With Us, what Jesus really has to say about poverty. Today's focus will be on Life Ties, an organization that fights poverty by supporting young adults who are at risk in our world. We have this video as a, a teaser for you. So watch, listen to what we will be talking about this afternoon. Around like I'm November like, 2019, I was just like in and out of my mom's house and it was like a toxic environment. She ended up kicking me out. I was literally living out of my car. So my mother uh, dropped custody of me because I was transgender. And uh, I really don't know where I was going to end up. Because I was only 17. I'm, I was only a child. I went from being in a shelter, foster care, back to the shelter. It was really hard for me because I was going through a lot and I had a lot of um, insulation and I was depressed a lot. I just wanted to get away from like the environment I was in. It was hostile, very like negative. And, and I didn't want to be around it so Coming to this program gave me time to be outside of that type of environment. The mission of Life Ties is to nurture wellness and self-sufficiency in vulnerable youth, young adults, and their families. The youth that we serve is homeless, at risk of being homeless, or aging out of the child welfare system. The goals of our program are to, one, provide a safe haven for our youth, uh, a place where they can actually thrive mentally, physically, and even spiritually for some. At Triad House, the youth range in age from 16 to 21, and we specialize in services to youth that are LGBTQ um, and other youth who are LGBTQ friendly. In our Rainbow House program, we serve adolescent females ages 12 to 21. We have three distinct uh, populations that we serve, women and their infant and toddlers. We have our youth with chronic health conditions, and we serve in all of our programs youth who have histories of trauma and behavioral health challenges. It's important to help other youth who is going through the same situation as I am. I was glad that I found something that has to do with LGBT that I didn't have to feel like I have to go to another group home that doesn't set me for being who I am. We provide a myriad of services which include life skills training, therapeutic support services, both individual and group therapies, specialized and allied therapies, in addition to linkages uh, to community organizations that assist with the development of skills for individuals living. We invite you. Our philosophy is join us this afternoon at one o'clock to learn more about life ties and to learn more about how this congregation is working to resist poverty and to move people out of poverty in our community. So join us 
at one o'clock this afternoon. The link for that gathering is in the newsletter and is also on our website and on Facebook page to join us for that time. We hope that you will find peace and hope and perhaps even a bit of joy in our worship this day. We begin our worship as we have throughout this pandemic time by lighting our unity candle. We light this candle to remind us of Christ's presence with us in the midst of this pandemic, connecting us in all of our separate places, strengthening all those serving the front lines of the pandemic and encouraging all who have been laid low. We come to worship God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Soon you will see the call to worship appearing on your screen. We gather together to worship God, the shepherd of our souls, the one who has created us, who sustains us, who redeems us, who walks beside us in good times and bad, and who calls us to follow. This is our God. Let us worship God together. And we raise our voices this morning singing our first hymn. It's number 231 in your purple hymnals at home, or you may look at the words posted now on your screen. Let us now pray together. Almighty God, 
we fail to love one another because we love the things of this world more. We love having possessions because they make us feel valued. The more possessions we have, the more we feel safe and secure. We worry that we will not have enough while others go hungry and homeless. Forgive us for being possessed by our possessions. Forgive us for turning to wealth instead of love. Call us back into your commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. If we live this out, we know there will be enough for everyone, for you have provided an abundant earth for us all. Call us into mutual love, understanding, and care. In Jesus' name, amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, hear the good news of God's presence with us and be assured of the goodness of God. You will see soon a, a slide on your screen. Please respond with the bold lines. When our hearts condemn us for failing to love one another, we remember that God is greater than our hearts. God knows us and loves us still and forgives us for our shortcomings. You are forgiven. We extend that same grace and forgiveness to others. You are loved. So we share this love with one another. You have no condemnation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We will go now and share the good news. Amen. And we now sing our response with the hymn, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. It's hymn number 803 in your hymnals at home. And soon the words for the hymn will appear on the screen.
The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good friends, I invite you to think about your past week. Those moments during this week when Christ felt most present with you. When you felt those blessings of God most fully. When you think about those times that God was leading you through these days. Know those times and find the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ in your hearts, in your being. With the confidence that God is with you always and will supply you with all your needs, no matter what the situation. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we now move into the portion of our service where we hear the word proclaimed. Please pray with me. God of all grace and mercy, your scripture, your word is as a lamp for our feet as we walk our paths of discipleship. How good it is to listen to your word when we are together. Lord, we ask that you send your spirit into our hearts this morning, that we may be convicted, we may be changed, we may be inspired in our faith and faithfully proclaim your good news. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning it comes from John's Gospel at chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, as I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I invite you to listen again as I read to you from the book of Acts, from the fourth chapter, beginning with the first verse through the twelfth verse. Listen to the word of our Lord. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts, O Lord. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence with us, to the power of your word, to the power of your spirit, working in our midst. Amen. So I have to get something used to something new here. Up till today, whenever I sat in the stool and looked right at the camera, I was able to see the picture that you were seeing. 
that's now off to the side. And it's a little bit disconcerting to speak just to a camera. <laughs> but anyway, know that this Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter is called the Good Shepherds Sunday. It's called the Good Shepherd Sunday because every year in each of the years of the lectionary cycles, the good parable, excuse me, Psalm 23rd is a part of the scripture readings. And each year through the three year cycle of the lectionary, the passage from the gospel comes from John 10, the Good Shepherd uh, chapter. Each year, there's a separate section of that chapter taken. This year, it is the one that Anne read to you. The good shepherd lies down his life for the sheep, and the sheep know his voice. Today's passage from John would have us wonder, though, I think, about the other sheep that do not belong in the fold, the ones who know Jesus' name, voice but and his name, but do not are not a part of the fold that we are. Now there's lots of ways to understand that. There's lots of ways to see that as there are folks who will join us in this fold or there are other folds that will also lead to salvation. But at the core of that is the understanding that God is at work in Jesus Christ to bring all people, all the sheep folds together in salvation. Acts tells us a little bit about how to go about being a part of this one fold of Christ. In the Good Shepherd, the 23rd Psalm, we hear the comforting assurance of God's presence, of God's care, no matter where we may be, no matter what the journey we are on, no matter where we've wandered to or where we find ourselves. We are assured that God is with us. There is no place we can go that is beyond God's care, God's love. Think about that and the meaning of that in the midst of this time when we are separated by a pandemic, when we are separated by different political understandings, by different views of race, of poverty, Think about what it means that there is nothing in all of that that will separate us from God. No matter how wrong we are, no matter how right we are, God will still care for us, comfort us, and supply our need. Here in the book of Acts, the scene is set for us by Pentecost just being had, having been a few days before the power of the Spirit coming upon the disciples, joining them, linking them, empowering them. Throughout the, the book of Acts, you will hear that language of the disciples, the apostles, empowered by the Spirit, speaking in the Spirit. That's true here in this scene. Remember that just before this, Peter and John have healed a man born lame, a man who's never walked, a man who they carried to, to, into the temple so that he could beg for alms from the people. They come into the portico of the temple, they see this man being carried in and they focus on him and they invite him to focus on them. And by this power of the spirit, he is healed. Peter reaches out and lifts him up by his hand to stand. The first time in his life he has stood. He is healed in front of all the people. They are amazed. So what does Peter do? He does what Peter always does when he's in a group of people who are amazed by the power of God. He preaches a sermon. I wish I could preach to that many people and get that many converts on a Sunday. Who knows? Maybe someday we will because of the camp. I'm not sure it'll be my voice though. But anyway, empowered by the Spirit, Peter speaks. and People hear. People know by what name, by what power, what, by what presence this man was healed. 
And then as he's winding up his sermon in the conclusion, this group arrives. They weren't there with them. You'll note that because it, the scripture tells us Peter is speaking to the people. But then this group arrives. And who's there? Well, the priests, the captain of the temple, who's kind of like the captain of the guard, and the Sadducees. The Sadducees, there's not a whole lot of clarity on who they were, but they were people of faith, of the Jewish faith. They believed, they did not apparently believe in the resurrection. They did believe in their power and in their authority. So perturbed a bit by Peter and John who are teaching about this man that this group had helped condemn and had supported the crucifixion of. By his name, they are preaching and teaching about a resurrection from the dead. And they've just shown the power to make that happen in the life of one who was considered less than fully human, that man born lame. So they arrest him. Speaks a lot about power, doesn't it? That they could just show up and had the power to arrest Peter and James for what they said. Think about how that power, how that secular power, if you will, is still lived out in our times. Think about how when miracles happen, what the reaction of those in power is. When life is changed, when change is preached, what's the reaction of those in power? Think about that. Also remember that back right after Pentecost, Peter preached, 3,000 were saved, came to believe. Here, 5,000, wow causes quite a stir. So those Sadducees, priests, people of power come and their first question when they bring him before the trial the next day is, by what name, by what power do you do what you've done? You note that they don't try to convince people that the man wasn't healed because the man standing right there with Peter and John at that time. The evidence of their power to bring about the healing is there before all to see. Their response is powerful. Their response is by the name of the one you crucified and God raised from the dead. That is the power, that is the authority by which we are carrying out this healing. One who was born lame, one who had never walked, one who you would not notice, God has healed by the name of Jesus Christ. As we were beginning, to set up today. Carol out was here and, and we were talking about the hymns we picked today. Yes, there's a lot of music, but the hymn that we're going to sing right after this sermon is, is um, I, my hope lies in my hope nothing. My hope is built nothing less. Carol was joking about my hope is built in nothing. How important that next word is nothing less than Christ himself. In this passage from the book of Acts, Peter is naming the power that is work at work in our midst, the power that is work at work continually in God's creation to change that which is wrong, to lift up those who are downtrodden, to bring healing to those who need healing, to bring resurrection to those who are dead, 
dead in spirit, dead to life. It is the power of the name of Jesus Christ, the one that was rejected by the leaders, the one whose teaching and healing and prophetic voice was not heard, is now being heard by the people. It is by that name, by that voice, that this man was healed. It is by that name, by this voice, that this world is being changed. Peter and the other apostles claimed that power, claimed that reality for them. They may, may and probably did face those times when they felt their hope was built on nothing, but the reality is that their hope was built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. He uses Peter does scripture here to talk about the stone that was rejected. That's Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah that would be rejected and yet would become the cornerstone. Paul writes that that cornerstone is a very stumbling block for so many people because they cannot find in themselves the power to accept God's work God's resurrection that was carried out in Jesus Christ. They could not understand that that power and that possibility was there for their own lives. You and I, we claim to be Christians. We claim to live in the power of the spirit, in the power of the resurrection. When we say Jesus Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, and we add that line, and our lives are changed. What has changed our lives is the resurrection of Christ. And our lives are changed whether we name that or not, because God has acted. God has acted to guide us along those, those, our journey, to provide us with all that we should need to meet us in the dark, shadowy places of our life and to lead us out into the light and the promise of God's love. We are living into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that means accepting that God is at work in our midst, working to bring about a new way of living, a new life, and that the new way begins with you and me and how we live. It is a life of repentance, of turning from, away from hatred, away from fear, away from those things that bring, that bring death to others and turning toward love, the love that accompanies other in the midst of their pain, the love that shares one's resources with those who do not have the love that is not just sentimentality, but is lived out in the choices we make, the ways we live our own lives. It's a life lived recognizing the power of God to change my life, your life, our lives, to change this world and brings with it the resources, the abilities, the talents, the skills to make that happen. Friends, Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed and our lives have changed. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the coming of the spirit and that power imbues us with the possibilities. No, imbues us with the reality of our lives changing. And that change, bringing change for others. Live into the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, by your power, work through us, within us. By your spirit, empower us to speak the good news 
of the resurrection of Christ. And that in that comes the power to overcome everything that would hurt, divide, separate us from one another. It has the power in it to overcome all of those questions we have about race, about belief, about status, about wealth and power, so that we can live accepting one another, living out your commandment to love one another, even as you have loved us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, I invite you to respond now by joining and singing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let us join our voices in song. to hear and believe? What does it mean to be saved? It means to hear the good news of the gospel and respond in ways that show God's love, even as you have experienced it. There are many ways that we do that, many ways that we become disciples of Jesus Christ. We study the word of God. We study how that can be lived out in our own lives. We give of ourselves in many different ways. One of which, of course, is our offering that we present to the Lord each week or as often as we are able. Giving of ourselves for the glory of God and to bring about that beloved community that God wishes for us all. We invite you to join in becoming a part of the beloved community of sharing who you are, what you are, with all God's people. Let us together share in the blessings of being children of God. I invite you now to prepare for a time of prayer by joining our voices in singing number 814, In God Alone. We will be singing this twice through.
It is a song that comes out of the, the community in France, the Taze community that worships in repetitive music that helps us focus then into the presence of the Spirit. Let us prepare to pray by singing. Before we pray together, I just want to let you know that in this coming edition of our church newsletter, that would be the May edition, there is uh, many folks, there's listings of many folks in the prayer concerns list. And I encourage you when you get this new newsletter, I encourage you to look at that list and to continue your prayers for those listed there. Now let us pray together. Lord, we lift up your sheep in this flock. We lift up Edie Maltop and ask for healing of her injured leg. We lift up Sylvia and Wayne Allen in this time of uncertainty. We lift up Jim and Shirley Disler in a time when your healing of Jim is so critical. Lord, we pray for those who give care to those such as Jim, such as Wayne. We ask that the care and the medical attention be your care and attention unto them. We lift up those who are healing this day from surgery or from other instances, perhaps crisis of faith or times of great trial. We lift up John Breckenridge and ask for your continuing strength that his body heals and recovers. We lift up this day the Kumar family, BJ, Sheila, their children, Chelsea and Kathleen, and particularly their extended family in India. We lift up Lord, those who are affected in India and around the world and here at home by the experience of coronavirus. We lift up those today in Armenia, those who recall the Armenian genocide of 1915. We lift up those who have suffered and who continue to experience the impact. We pray for all those around the world who know the impact of hatred. We lift up those in our country who continue to be impacted by systemic racism and systemic differences and expressions of violence. We pray for those here at home who have known an experience of the virus in terms of a new vibrant, new variants, new variants of the virus. We pray for other places in the world also experiencing the variants of the virus. Particularly this day, we lift up young adults in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are now hospitalized with the virus. We pray for those who are unemployed. 
We pray for those who are food insecure. We pray for all those whom you would have be in your flock and who yet have not heard your voice, Lord. We know that for them, you are their shepherd. We pray for their peace and well being and for their openness to love. We pray for those in our congregation this day who lead our church. We pray for Pastor Paul. We pray for the session, for the deacons. We pray for the parish leaders and all those who participate in our parish system. We pray this day for our denomination and we pray for our presbytery, which is forming a new entity, the central presbytery. Lord, we lift up the work of all those who are living into the new day, whether it be at the level of the synod, the central presbytery, the level of our congregations in our presbytery and in the specialized ministries of our presbytery. And Lord, as we lift up all these concerns and we lift up these prayers of hope, we do so knowing your presence with us made known to us so clearly through your son who taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us sing the hymn, My Life Flows On. Soon you will see the words on your screen. If you're at home, it is hymn number 821 in your hymnal. We have this thing we humans do. Americans probably even more so than some. That we see ourselves as independent. 
and we resist the need to rely on anyone else. But the reality is we do. We rely on a gracious and loving God. And we should claim that. We should share that good news with all those who keep striving to make do on their own. But let them know they're not alone, that their strength is not just in their own muscles or in their own wealth, but rather our strength comes in Christ Jesus. I encourage you to claim that for yourself and to share that with others. After all, we just sang, the peace of Christ makes fresh my heart a fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? Let us sing out that Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that changes life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.